So good evening, friends. So I'll be talking on this topic, uh, transfusion triggers in ICU. So this is a preamble to the journal that's going to be discussed, which is the MINT trial. So I wish to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Manjunath, who helped me develop this content. Uh, so just to give a backdrop, there are uh, at least 45 randomized controlled trials done in this topic. So I'll just take you through some of the key trials which is of relevance and what is our understanding on transfusion. So when you look at the trials, so the first trial that talked about restrictive transfusion was the TRIC trial that came in 1999. And if you see, most of these trials are published in very good journals. So this came in New England NEJM. So in 2010, after 1999, after about 10 years, the TRAC trial came. So this was done, this came in JAMA. Uh, this was to look at restrictive and liberal transfusion difference in post-cardiac surgery patients. So that was a distinct set of patients they looked at. In 2011, focus trial came again in NEJM where they looked at uh, the transfusion triggers between restrictive and liberal in uh, hip surgery who are, uh, or someone who is at a high risk of cardiovascular event in hip surgery. 2013, there was a study that came in upper GI bleed, uh, whether there is a difference between the restrictive or the liberal transfusion. And 2014, the TRIST trial came, uh, which was uh, another Danish trial, came from Denmark, which was a comprehensive trial, uh, which sort of uh, dawned upon the clarity on our understanding. 2021 was the most recent. So the MINT trial, what which will be discussed, is a little similar to reality trial. So you can little pay attention to reality trial, which is looking at transfusion triggers in someone with myocardial infarction or with anemia. And 2023, there was this international guidelines which gave sort of levels of recommendations on the transfusion triggers. So this is sort of summary of the key trials that came over last, last uh, 25 years. Uh, so we'll just go one by one. So the TRIC trial was the earliest trial. It was a multi-center randomized controlled trial of transfusion in critically ill. This is was uh, done by Canadian authors. So this study was done in 838 patients who were uvolemic and hemoglobin was less than 9. So here they divided the patient into restrictive group, 480, 418 patients in restrictive group, where they gave transfusion if hemoglobin was less than 7 grams to maintain the hemoglobin range between 7 to 9 grams per deciliter. And the liberal the number of patients was 420, where they gave a transfusion if hemoglobin is less than 10 grams. So the threshold was 10 grams as a trigger to transfuse blood. And they maintained hemoglobin between 10 to 12. So this was a restricted and liberal. And if you see most of the studies, they'll be following this sort of a pattern of 7 versus 10 as a threshold. Some of the studies have taken 8. The focus trial on the hip surgery has taken 8. So you'll see that. So when you look at the results of the study, so this was a positive study. 838 patients randomized between restricted and liberal. When they looked at 30 day mortality, uh, there was no statistically significant difference between the restrictive and liberal. But when they looked at the subgroup, so they looked at uh, stable patients where Apache 2 was less than 20. So, which means they looked at less sicker patients. The 30 day mortality was much lesser in the restrictive. So, which means to say if someone is uh, less sicker, so they are the people who you should not be transfusing because these are the patients who had a worser outcome with unnecessary transfusion. And even the age, so in the lesser age group, here they looked at age less than 50, 55 years, the effect was more pronounced in the restrictive group in improving the outcomes. As you see the mortality, 30-day mortality was 5.7 in the restrictive as compared to 13 in liberal in younger age group. And in cardiac, they looked at the subgroup of cardiac diseases. They did not find any difference between restrictive and liberal. But hospital mortality also was significantly less in the restrictive group, 22.2% versus 28.1%. So this was a study which sort of uh, brought about this in a bold way that we should not unnecessarily transfuse and maintaining the transfusion threshold of 7 improves the outcome. So this was the first sort of a revelation that came in the trick trial. So after this, after many years, so this came in around 2000, after about 14 years, a similar trial came done by Denmark group called the TRIST trial, again published in any game. Lower versus higher hemoglobin threshold for transfusion in septic shock. The reason I have taken up this in order is because these are the type of patients we deal in ICU. Here, it was a little bigger study than the TRIST trial. So 998 patients with septic shock 
again he, uh, they took patients who had hemoglobin less than line so divided into lower threshold group and higher threshold 502 patients in lower threshold where they transfused it's very similar to the trick trial hb less than 7 they gave transfusion and higher threshold hb less than 9 they gave the blood transfusion little bigger studies on the trick trial here the only difference is they gave leuco depleted blood cells as opposed to the trick where they give prbc primary outcome was to look at 90 day mortality so when you look at the results it was equivocal 998 patients 502 in the lower threshold where transfusions were given when hemoglobin fell less than 7 higher threshold less than 9 so 90 day mortality there was no difference between the lower threshold or higher threshold and they looked at any adverse events like ischemic events serious adverse events and life support them so this was the equivocal trial which basically said like if you see the trick trial, it showed benefit in less sicker patients or in younger age group and hospital mortality was benefit. But this trial said you either uh, give no transfusion or transfusion or lower threshold or higher threshold. There was no difference with regards to outcome. And even with regards to adverse events like ischemic events or serious adverse, there was no difference. So it was an equivocal trial. So then we'll talk about this focus trial, which looks at liberal or restrictive transfusion in high risk patients after hip surgery. This was published in 2011 by the U.S. author. So here they looked at the transfusion needs in patients who underwent hip surgery. So they took 2016 patients. To, so it's quite a big study. And patients' age group was more than 50 years who had history. So these are the hip surgeries who are at a higher risk of cardiovascular events and who had history of cardiovascular disease. So here they again divided into liberal and uh, restrictive group. And if you see trick trial and TRIS, they put hemoglobin in restricted as 7. Because these patients were, had a cardiovascular disease or were at a risk for cardiovascular, they took hemoglobin threshold of 8 as a restrictive and liberal as 10 grams per deciliter. Primary outcome, they looked at a composite of death and patient's inability to walk at 60 day follow-up after hip injury, which means they are debilitated that they could not walk uh, 60 days after the surgery. So they took the composite of death and inability to walk at 60 days as a as the follow up as a composite endpoint. So 2016 patient, uh, so I think this is 1010, I think. So if you look at the transfusion requirements in liberal, obviously they had more transfusion, restrictive it was nil. So restrictive, they didn't have to give any blood. So primary outcome, which is a composite of death and inability to walk at 60 days, there was no difference between liberals. So this is also an equivocal study. It basically said you don't need to try unnecessarily transfuse. It did not really change the outcomes. But they looked at hospital uh, acute coronary syndrome, ACS events within the hospital and death. So even there, there was no difference between the liberal and restrictive. So the, someone who is at a risk of developing cardiac events within the hospital and death within the hospital, there was no difference. Because if you see the hospital mortality was better in the restrictive in trick trial, that was not the case in focus trial. And they looked at 60 days follow-up, death after 60 days follow-up. Again, there was no difference between the liberal and the restrictive group. So this was non-significant between. So basically the TRIS trial, the focus trial basically said either you restrict or you give blood, you did not have any bearing on the outcomes of any of these patients. And they looked at complications. It was similar between liberal and restrictive group. So then this is the most recent trial that came, reality randomized, because the whole argument for our intensities is, oh, this patient has cardiac history, so we should maintain a higher hemoglobin of 9, 10, so on and so forth. This study was done to address that. This came from the French group. Effect of restrictive versus liberal blood transfusion on major cardiovascular events among patients with myocardial infarction and anemia. So it was a reality randomized control trial. The study was done in 35 hospitals in, in France and Spain. So they had 668 patients who had acute coronary event of some nature and they compared hemoglobin of 7 grams versus 10 grams. So if you saw the trick trial 7 and 9, so TRIS 7 and 9, so focus is 8 and 10. Here they compared 7 grams and 10 grams. And out of 668, 30, 30 day follow-up happened in 666. So there were two dropouts. And the, the median age was 77 years and the range was 69 to 84. 281, 42.2% of the patients were females in this particular study. So the results in reality, 666 patients, 342 in restrictive, 324 in liberal. As you say, restrictive, 
uh, got 122 units of blood and liberal had got 323. So 99.7% of the patients had got blood in liberal group in this trial. So they looked at major adverse cardiac events. Again, there was no difference. So this is in patients who had MI, who had acute coronary syndrome, comparing hemoglobin of 7 and 10. So they did not find any difference with regards to major adverse cardiac events, and it was non-inferior. And all-cause mortality, they looked between restrictive, there was no difference. It was 5.6% in restrictive and 7.7% in liberal. They looked at recurrent MI, which was again no difference between restrictive and liberal. They looked at patients who needed to undergo emergency uh, coronary intervention. There was no difference, 1.5 in restrictive and 1.9% liberal. They looked at ischemic stroke, it was similar. So basically, in patients with acute coronary syndrome, either you maintain a 7 or 10, they did not really make a difference with regards to cardiovascular. So this trial is important because the MINT trial, which, you are, which will be discussed by the or by the speaker subsequently is very similar to this. Even in MINT trial, they have looked at coronary uh, acute myocardial infarction patients and seeing whether uh, higher hemoglobin makes a difference. Obviously, we'll discuss on that. So this is very similar to that trial. This came in 2021. So now we'll look into this TRACS trial. So this came in cardiac surgery patients, again published in JAMA in 2010. So study done in Brazil and by the Belgian authors. So it's mainly done in Brazil, TRACS randomized control trial. So in patients undergoing cardiac surgery, so done between February 2009 to 2010, so they had 502 patients, so divided again in the liberal group, here they targeted hematocrit. So liberal group, they maintained hematocrit more than 30% and restrictive, they maintained hematocrit more than 24%. Outcome, they looked at composite endpoint of 30-day all-cause mortality and severe comorbidities that patient developed, that uh, the patient developing cardiogenic shock. ARDS or acute kidney injury needing hemodialysis. So they looked at the composite. Like in the focus trial, they looked at the composite endpoint of death and inability to walk at 60 days follow-up. So they took, like any other cardiac study, they looked at composite endpoint of mortality with other complications. So in TRAX trial, 253 in liberal, 249 in restrictive. The transfusion needs in liberal was 78%. In restrictive, only half of the patients got blood. So primary endpoint, which is a composite of uh, severe comorbidities and mortality, as you see, there was no difference between liberal and restrictive group. It was non-inferior. But what this study tracks showed is number of bloods transfused had an independent risk, was an independent risk for developing hospital complications and death at 30 days. And most importantly, they showed with every additional unit of blood transfusion, there was increase in the hazard of death. So hazard ratio of 1.2 and that became statistically significant. Which means here they really looked at the correlation between the number of units transfused and the mortality and they found with every unit that was added, there was an increase in the risk of death in this track cell. So that was a strong message that came out from this track cell. So if you see from all the narratives so far, all the studies are non-inferior because none of the studies showed so except the trick study which happened in 1999. We showed improved outcomes with restrictive transmission. The shock trial, the TRIS trial, the TRAX trial, none of them showed benefit with restrictive. Rather, it showed there's no difference between it. So that's why the mid trial becomes relevant because there are signals towards harm in mid trial um, by being restrictive. There are signals, but it was not significant anyway that we discussed. So this is another study which looked at transmission strategies for acute upper GI bleed. Uh, this came in again in a game by the Spanish authors in 2013. So they took 921 patients, randomized between restrictive and liberal, 461 in restrictive, 416 liberal. So number of transmission was around 51% in restrictive. And uh, it was, uh, so sorry, it's not a number of, see, the number of patients who did not have blood transmission was more in restrictive, 51. So no transmission, 51% in restrictive, 14% in liberal. So here, this was a hugely positive study. Uh, so until now, you have seen equivocal. This particular study, they looked at six-week survival was higher in the restrictive group, group in patients who had upper GI bleed. And this uh, significance was found in patients who had bleed due to peptic ulcer or child A and child B cirrhosis, but not in. So this is one study, like trick study, which had a positive outcome in restrictive transfusion. So in upper GI bleed, you restrict the transfusion 
they had a better outcome. And they looked at the risk of further bleeding also was less in the restrictive group, 10% as opposed to 16% in liberal. And the adverse event also was significantly less in the restrictive group. And in fact, they showed the portal pressures increased where patients were liberally tracked. So this was a positive. So until now, in my narrative, the trick trial was positive, And this trial, which came in NEGM on upper GI bleed, showed a significant benefit with restrictive transmission because the survival was better in restrictive and the complications also were lessened in restrictive. So that is about the studies now. So now in 2023, they came out with these guidelines based on all these studies. And as I already made a mention, there are 45 trials done so far, mm -hmm. randomized controlled trials to compare between restrictive and liberal, encompassing 20,600 patients, close to 20,600 patients. So this is the amount of data we have. And most of these studies have compared 7 to 8 versus 9 to 10 sort of a transmission threshold. So the recommendations that come out is, in recommendation 1, in hospitalized patients for hemodynamically stable, uh, so the transfusion thresholds or the trigger should be 7 grams is acceptable. Only if it is less than 7, one should consider transfusion. So here they give a strong recommendation. Grade 1 is strong recommendation with moderate level of evidence, grade 1B. And in patients who are undergoing cardiac surgery, the, the transfusion trigger can be kept at 7.5 grams per deciliter is what the recommendation. In patients... And this particular recommendation came mainly from the focus trial where they compared 8 and 10. In patients undergoing hip surgery, so the transfusion trigger could be kept at 8 grams per deciliter. So these are the recommendations that came from these guidelines. The recommendation 2 is in oncology patients, also the, the transfusion trigger or threshold should be 7 grams per deciliter. And this is a conditional recommendation with a low quality evidence. Recommendation 3 and 4 are for children. Although I, I don't I didn't cover any studies because we are all adult intensive. In children, just to remember the guidelines are very similar. In critically ill children who are hemodynamically stable, who do not have hemoglobinopathies or who do not have cyanotic heart disease, the transfusion trigger, even for children, is seven grams per deciliter. Strong recommendation with moderate level of evidence. Recommendation four is in patients with congenital heart disease. If they've had a biventricular repair, even there, the, the transfusion thresholds are 7 grams per deciliter. If, we, if a child has only single ventricle, then there is a higher threshold of 9 grams per deciliter. If, uh, if a child has congenital heart disease, which is not treated, even their hemoglobin threshold of 7 to 9 is acceptable with low quality of evidence. So these are the guidelines based on 45 randomized controlled trials encompassing around 20,600 patients. So this is the take-home message for all our trainees. Uh, so, 7 is good enough at this point of time because you saw all the studies which shows no difference between either you maintain 7 or 9. But now with mint trial, anyway, after the discussion, it will possibly open up a little vista because there are signal pointing out towards benefit with being liberal. We'll anyway discuss about that. So, thank you one and all. So, I request you all to submit your valuable work to the Journal of Acute Care, which comes out every three months. You can visit my website, www.drpadipanga.com to rehash to this. So thank you, thank you, Anandam. And over to my next speaker.